a form of live bacteria to the mix. This is to add strength to the koi and to prevent infection from occurring, fry of this size being incredibly susceptible to disease in the first few weeks of their life. Once the food had been ground to far finer granules, we followed Kentaro and some of the staff to the fry ponds as they made one of their twice daily checks. The ponds are completely surrounded by netting and covered with wire, again to deter would-be predators. At 400 square metres in size, this pond contains approximately 50,000 Kohaku fry, spawned just over two weeks ago. You can see how the orange coloration is already beginning to show, although any sign of pattern is still to emerge. Kentaro took some food and walked around the entire perimeter of the pond, distributing evenly the finely ground powder. These ponds are fed approximately five kilograms of food per day, and although it appears so small that it's hardly worth putting into the water, even at this size, the fry are happy to receive it. Kentaro admitted that so many of the western hobbyists he had met actually feed koi in their home ponds with far too large a pellet. He explained that the food offered should be of a size suitable for the smallest fish in the pond. He went on to say that even then, the smaller the pellet given, the easier it is to digest. Notice again here how very heavy aeration is present. The staff use feeding time as an opportunity to check all ponds, both for the growth and development of the koi, as well as for any sign of infection or disease. Whilst the various processes involved in producing fry of this size are indeed fascinating, Sakai Fish Farm are primarily known for producing mouth-watering nishikigoi of far larger sizes. Kentaro beckoned for us to follow him as he headed up into the hills to check on some of the largest mud ponds the farm owned. Taking a short drive to the outskirts of Daiwa, as the road begins to wind its way up into the mountains, Kentaro stopped the car by three of the farm's largest mud ponds. You will notice that not only are these ponds primarily functional, but that also a number of attractive plants and shrubs have been placed around their perimeter. This is nothing whatsoever to do with Nishikigoi, simply that Kentaro's father, the man universally known as Hiroshima Sakai, wanted the area to look nice for the people who had to pass it on a daily basis. How good to see that the farm are willing to give something back to the community in which they are based. There are in fact three ponds adjacent to one another, all man-made, gradually sloping down the hillside into the valley. The very, very high-grade koi that Sakai produce, those that would compete for the top show prizes, do not go to mud ponds. Instead, they are kept in concrete ponds back at the facility, so the staff can watch them at far closer quarters. That is not to say that these koi are low class, far from it. These are koi that the farm will sell for thousands of pounds each, such as their quality and size. All are 70 centimetres plus, but as is often the way, look smaller when viewed from such a distance. These ponds actually only contain 30 koi each, and again this is the primary reason as to why the Japanese can achieve such phenomenal growth rates. The sheer volume of water that each one has, combined with the favourable water temperatures that the region naturally produces, means that these fish are given every opportunity to thrive. Factors such as this also contribute to the overall price of koi when you consider what it costs to not only purchase this land, but to excavate it, farm it, and maintain it, it's little wonder that koi of this quality carry considerable price tags. That's without even taking into account the amount of food required to upkeep the stocks, or the man hours that go into physically doing all this work. The hot, humid weather, however, allows the koi to sit and bask in the conditions, and it's only when the automatic feeding machine dispatches a measured amount of food that the koi suddenly seem to awake from their stupor and move across the pond. Some of the koi present here are oyagoi, those that have not been used as parents this year. Sakai has just over 100 from which to choose, although obviously the farm doesn't have the space to be able to spawn from all of them every year. This number of oyagoi, however, gives the staff so many combinations from which to choose future parents, and so much opportunity to experiment with certain sets, and to monitor their offspring. The worldwide koi market continues to expand and change with every passing year. Ten years ago, Kentaro explained, the farm had only one or two foreign customers. Nowadays, they can barely keep up with the demand. 
The Japanese market for koi, however, has slowly declined over time and only now is beginning to show signs of resurgence as a new generation of hobbyists begin to take up the reins. Yet again, all three of the ponds are heavily aerated using mechanical generators, the oxygen from which stimulates water movement and therefore movement of the koi also. The pond, of course, also contains high levels of natural food on which the koi will feed. Being as they are, members of the carp family, they are natural bottom feeders and will enjoy nothing more than burying their noses into the pond floor in search of a morsel of natural food. This diet is highly supplemented, of course, by Sakai's own highly secret koi pellets, which are given to the fish four times a day. These koi will stay in this pond until October, when they will return to the farm and either be offered directly for sale or overwintered as either tatigoi or oyagoi. The town of Daiwa lies in the very heart of Japan's southwestern region and as such finds itself largely surrounded by open plains, forests and rugged landscapes. Indeed, just a couple of minutes walk from the Sakai facility will find you surrounded by a beautiful bamboo forest nestled amongst the seemingly endless rice paddies. Upon closer inspection, you can actually find some very interesting wildlife, things such as this incredible spider that we found crawling along an upright bamboo. Various snakes are also often seen, as well as many other forms of uniquely Japanese wildlife. Whether or not the spider was actually poisonous or not, we didn't wait around to find out. We thought it was more sensible to return to the farm, knowing for a fact that Nishikigoi don't bite. The next stage in the jigsaw of successfully breeding koi comes some 40 days later, when the fry return to the farm for their first cull. Kentaro explained that this cull was so important as it determined those koi that would actually go on to become what the farm would refer to as tatigoi. Whilst not all those selected will even make it past their first year, at this stage they have been deemed as having a certain potential. For the staff this is a long and arduous task and at least eight people are doing this job every single day for most of the entire season of summer. They all take it in turns to do this job, and even Kentaro, his father and his uncle are happy to muck in and do their bit. Each and every member of staff is given a counter, so there is a record of exactly how many koi have been selected. This data is invaluable in the years to come. Note, yet again, that aeration is used heavily at all times in order to aid the overall well-being of the koi. Kentaro explained that in Kohaku, this variety, the most important single factor was that there was some kind of red pigmentation visible on the head. Any koi without this would immediately be discarded. All Kohaku, of whatever size, should have some kind of head marking. Kentaro took time out to show us exactly what he meant. All of these koi have been selected to grow on, and if you focus on any single one in this net, you will clearly see that every single one has some kind of head marking. Even were a koi to have perfect body shape and fantastic skin, without a decent pattern it would be unsellable. Even though the colours are faint, you can still see them beneath the skin, and in time they will hopefully come through. Notice also the difference in size, but the very small ones still make the grade only very, very tiny koi that have some form of defect would be discarded for being too small. Even though all these koi come from exactly the same spawning, it's incredible to see the difference in size already. Body shape at this stage is also unimportant, unless the koi has a disproportionately large head that tapers quickly to a very thin body. Approximately three quarters of these fry will not make it past this first cull, whilst those selected will go back into the fry pond for a further 20 days before being culled again. Those kept after that point are then housed in the large Sakai Tozai facility to be grown on for the remainder of the summer. Kentaro stressed again and again that only those koi with any semblance of red on the head would be kept. You can see how even the tiny ones have been selected. The staff are very strict as to the koi they discard. If they are in any doubt as to whether or not the koi is suitable, it will be rejected. The farm believe that it's the severity of the cull that allows such high quality koi to emerge a year or so down the line. Overstocking in a fry pond is a definite no-no. They need as much space per fish as is possible. The importance of this operation cannot be underestimated. 
it is fundamentally vital to the development of Sakai Koi and is the primary reason why summer on the farm will always be the busiest time of the year. As we've seen, newly hatched fish go into the fry ponds at just a few days old and remain there for approximately 40 days before they are gathered up into a holding tank and returned to the farm. Approximately 75% of those fry are then culled, as the staff choose only those that show any sign at all of developing into potentially sellable nishkigoi. From here the remaining quarter return to the fry ponds for another 20 days. This is a pond of Sankey about to undergo their second culling. At about 3 or 4 centimetres in length you will notice an awful lot of black on their bodies something that's a characteristic of being put into a fry pond and something that will fairly quickly subside when the fish are brought inside to overwinter. What exactly in the water chemistry it is that causes such an amount of sumi, Kentaro was unsure, but speculated it's probably due to something in the natural mud on the bottom of the ponds. Whilst they are man-made with concrete sides, the bottoms are completely natural, thereby giving the koi access to minerals that naturally occur on the pond floor. Kentaro did admit, however, that Sankey were not as easy to breed or cull as some of the other varieties, that the success rate was not generally quite as high. Sankey as a whole, while still being one of the big three Go Sankey varieties, have actually decreased in their prominence in the past five years or so. At this year's All Japan Show, for example, the five top koi were either Kohaku or Showa, with not a single Sankey in sight. The staff are careful to ensure that the net is right to the edge of the pond and that all the koi are collected. Once inside the fish house, the labour-intensive task of culling yet another pond of fry begins. At all times of the year, the staff of Sakai Fish Farm work incredibly hard, certainly in the autumn time when the harvesting of mud ponds needs to be done, and the farm itself is awash with visitors from the four corners of the globe. Nothing, however, compares to summertime, when the process of spawning and culling is the main task. All the staff are capable of culling correctly, such as the training they are given by the management team of the farm. But to try and minimise what is, after all, a very laborious process, the staff are on a work rotor of jobs that need to be done. This ensures that each and every member of staff remains as fresh and motivated as possible. They clearly work very hard, but are treated well, and there is a tremendous sense of family at the Sakai facility. As we can see here, all the management and staff take breaks together and clearly enjoy one another's company. The Sakai fry ponds are actually only used for a very short space of time throughout the course of the year, from the point at which the newly hatched fry first go outside to when they return inside for their second culling. This 60 day period however is actually the most crucial, as it's during this time frame that the characteristics that ultimately define the koi naturally develop. As soon as they've been taken inside, the pond is drained down and a tractor is brought in to turn over the bottom of the pond. This regenerates the natural food and bacteria present in the mud, which contributes so much to the conditions these fry are kept in. Once the pond has been turned over, it is drained down and left until such time as it's ready to receive its next inhabitants. Once the fry have spent 60 days outside and endured two culls, those that make the initial grade are brought inside for what remains of the summer. This is the Sakai Tozai facility, a substantial greenhouse that contains only what the staff refer to as nursery ponds, all full of koi spawned earlier this year. None are over three months old, but already you can see the size of some of these fish. You will notice again that the stocking rate of these concrete ponds is kept to a sensible level in an attempt to help the koi grow each one containing between 1,500 and 2,000 koi. The water is of course heated, but the prevalent conditions of the area, especially in the height of summer, dictate a naturally high water temperature, and the ponds are less than a metre deep. This of course allows for the maximum growth of the koi, and many fish will double in size within a matter of weeks. Shade can be added to the greenhouse if required, and the fish are fed using automatic feeders four times a day. At the risk of repeating myself again, you can see that each pond is heavily aerated, ensuring a good level of oxygen at all times. The air temperature in this fish house is stiflingly hot, and in conditions like this, it's little wonder that such incredible growth rates are achieved. From the point the egg fertilises, a single fry 
has about a 2% chance of reaching this stage, so all these koi have actually done extremely well indeed to find themselves at this point. Exactly how they will develop from here though is another story for another time. This is virtually the final part of the spawning and culling process, and although some of these koi will be sold cheaply as tatishta, come the autumn time, many will continue as tatigoi and will go on to become excellent nisai, sansai and beyond. Although Sakai Fish Farm is located over an hour's drive from the actual city, no trip to the area would be complete without visiting the Hiroshima Peace Park, a memorial to the many thousands and thousands of people who died and continue to die as a result of the atomic bomb that devastated the city on the 6th of August 1945. We visited the park just one week shy of the 60th anniversary of the attack and as such saw a number of tribute wreaths being laid to commemorate the dead. The bomb actually exploded in mid-air a few metres before it hit the ground itself and in that moment the city of Hiroshima was turned into a living hell. Only a handful of buildings were left standing, one of which was this, the city's main civic hall. It was decided to leave it standing as an everlasting legacy of that fateful day. Visiting the park is an incredibly emotional and moving experience and some of the photographs displayed in the exhibition hall, especially those of Japanese children, are particularly haunting. There are various memorial statues around the park, but the most poignant of all is the eternal flame, something that has been burning since the park opened and will only ever be extinguished when the world's last nuclear weapon has been destroyed. Including this footage as part of a programme about breeding koi carp may seem somewhat flippant and unnecessary, but such is the impact the park has on those who visit, we felt it more than warranted inclusion. It's a place that makes you glad to be alive. We visit Japan to ultimately see koi, but as you wander around this place, you realise that there are far more important things in life. We sincerely hope you've enjoyed this visit to Hiroshima and the Sakai fish farm and that you've learned something about the way in which the Japanese masters of Nishikigoi approach the spawning and breeding of their living jewels. I must stress, however, that this is most definitely not a how to breed your own grand champion program. If anything, it opens my eyes to exactly how difficult it is to breed Nishikigoi to any level at all and how the conditions which we in the West have to contend with are actually not conducive to breeding high-class koi. A number of factors are against us, most notably the need to invest in suitable parent stocks, the need for a considerable area in which to undertake such a breeding programme, and of course the monetary investment required. There are a number of fish farms outside of Japan who are successfully breeding their own stocks now, and these people should certainly be highly commended. But for truly high grade koi, as of now, the only place to get them is the home of Nishikigoi itself. Such is the experience of these people, experience gained over virtually a lifetime's work dedicated to breeding better Nishikigoi, that they still retain the edge over people such as us, who only dream of achieving similar goals. Perhaps though, that's one of the reasons as to why the often talked about mystique of Koi remains so real, and why we return to the Far East time and time again. <laughs>